Welcome back to another Mac Tac Tac. Today we have another custom build featuring Edrix and Nev, twin casters. So I ran this deck for the first time in a long time this past Friday, and it did not disappoint. We're looking to create a ton of big beefy tokens and swing for the fences, and our token doubling commander helps us get there. Before we dive on in, I want to see you hit that subscribe button and ring that bell to make sure that you never miss an episode. As always, we give a shout out to one of our subscribers, and this one goes out to Moonlight Gaming. Moonlight, you rock. Let's start ourselves off with some high synergy cards. I'm talking of course about our token generators, and topping our list we have a few planeswalkers, starting with Garuk Primal Hunger. He has two different abilities that allow us to create token creatures, as well as one that's going to let us draw some cards. With our commander on the field, we'll be generating two 3-3 beasts a turn until we can alt to get two 6-6 six, six worms for each lane that we control. Following up our Primal Hunter, we have Tamiyo, Completed Sage. The only token they generate does cost us 7 loyalty, so it'll be here for a few turns before we can reach that token generation, but it does add discounts to our spells and free card draw, so it's definitely worth the wait. Of course, without creating any tokens to defend themselves, we kind of need to have a decent board state prior to casting them out into play, or the board basically needs to have just been wiped. Arasta of the Endless Web follows up our Planeswalkers as we move into Creatures, and is going to reward us with a Chump Locker in the form of a 1-2 Spider, with Reach for each time our opponents cast an Instant or Sorcery spell. They themselves have decent stats as a 3-5 for 4, and that reach is going to come in handy to stop any flyers our opponents are running. Zika, Fractal Theorist is here with Mage Craft, which is one of my favorite keywords from the Strixhaven set. And they're pulling double duty, allowing us not only to create powerful fractals based on the, the cost of our spell, but they also have the ability to make our tokens unblockable. Essex Fractal Bloom doesn't create tokens on their own, but they do let us change what kind of tokens we're creating which could definitely lead to some crazy board states with powerful turns. No, in fact, I'm not making a fractal. I'm making a copy of your commander. The flexibility of Essex cannot be understated. Coma Cosmos Serpent is a powerful commander in their own right and works wonders in this deck. They're a little expensive to get out, costing 8 mana, but when they hit the field, they get to start generating a 3-3 Serpent at each upkeep, and we can sack those Serpents to tap down our opponent's creatures, and keep Coma safe from ward wipes. Min, Wily Illusionist, can pop off hard, especially if an opponent is speeding her up with some group hug effects. Drawing extra cards in this deck is really easy, and we've already seen a few ways to do it, and there is certainly more to come. With all these cards in hand, when our tiny butted illusions die, we get to cheat some of our powerful creatures out onto the field. Nadir Kraken does make us pay for our new token friends, but with how much we're drawing and the amount of ramp we have in the deck, we don't necessarily mind paying that cost. They themselves get bigger when we pay the one, so we're effectively getting two power and two toughness on our board for one mana. Progenitor Mimic is here to reliably create copies of our creatures. Now they don't negate the legend rule, but we have a few ways to get around that in the deck, meaning we can make them a copy of a non-legendary copy of our commander and further multiply the number of tokens that we're generating. It's a token deck featuring green, so of course we have Scoot Swarm. With our commander doubling up the number of tokens we generate, Scoot Swarm is going to take over the entire field and we'll be free to swing out with literal swarms of tokens, overwhelming our opponents in the process. Solus the Eulogist requires us to have a token in play to create more tokens, but we are a token deck so that's pretty likely to be the case. She also lets us exile creatures from graveyards and serves to hate on reanimator strategies as she populates for us. We aren't done swarming just yet with Swarm Shambler its way into the deck. With Fractals being one of our main types of tokens we're looking to generate, plus one plus one counters are all over our board. And this Fungal Beast is going to make it so whenever our opponents attempt to target our creatures, rock in those counters, that we get to create 1-1 one, one Insects, which again, serve to chump block all day. Only one token-generating creature is left in the form of Talrand, Sky Summoner, 
Getting some flying drakes for casting our instant sorceries is pure value, and with that evasion, we aren't holding them back to chump lock, but rather swinging out to get in ship damage. Croaking Counterpart is up next in our spell slinging clone category and creates us a 1 1 frog copy of any creature on the field, and we can flash it back later should the need arise. Red of Replication is up and we're always looking to kick it. With our commander out, we're paying 9 mana and creating 10 copies of any creature at a minimum. This could take us from a barren board state to holy shit, look at that army in an instant. Spitting Image is a repeatable way to copy any creature on the board. Granted, the second use and beyond requires us to discard a land in addition to the normal cost, but given how many extra lands we're going to end up having in our hand just from like all the cards draw, not a big deal. Double Major is one of those ways to get around the legend roll that plagues this deck. I've used it to make non-legendary copies of my commander, as well as some other key legendary creatures in the deck to create effects. Druid's Deliverance is another double duty card. This one-sided fog allows us to populate while taking no damage. Theoretical Duplication is another way to build back quickly. In response to an opponent casting a powerful creature, we pay a mere 3 mana and get a copy of it and all other non-token creatures that enter the battlefield under their control this turn. Moving out of our spell summoning territory and into more repeatable effects, we have Blade of Cells, which gives our equipped creature Myriad, allowing them to create copies of themselves on attack, one for each opponent they weren't attacking. Combined Chrysalis is an interesting piece of token generation, forcing us to sack a token to make a token. Luckily for us, that makes it token positive with our commander. In addition to that, it grants all of our tokens flying, allowing them to avoid those pesky blockers our opponents have set up. Hum of Host is another way around that pesky legendary rule, and is going to create us a copy of a creature at the start of each of our combats. Lithoform Engine can make tokens a number of ways, including copying our commander's triggered ability, copying one of our instant and sorcery spells that generate tokens for us, or just copying a permanent spell. Mirror Box is up next, and while it doesn't generate tokens on its own, it does allow us to ignore the legendary rule and makes it so the original copy gets large and in charge. The next card is an interesting one. We're talking about Skyclave Relic, which we're looking to kick. These indestructible mana rocks basically pay for themselves with our commander out, netting us 5 mana rocks for the cost of 6. Granted, we can't use most of that mana right away, but you know, the ramp generated from it is second to none in this deck. Speaking of ramping with tokens, we have Awakening Zone, which is going to create us a 0-1 Eldrazi spawn at our upkeep, which we could sack to add mana to our pool. This is going to let us play ahead of curve and not waste all those extra cards that we've been drawing. Last up is Paradox Zone, which enters with a growth counter on it and then doubles the number of growth counters at the end of our turn and creates us a fractal based on the number of growth counters on it, meaning that each turn, those fractals are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. We've mentioned card draw quite a bit already, so let's go over how we're getting those extra cards. Topping our list is a copy of Rhystic Study, we're taxing our opponents, and most of them don't seem too keen on paying those taxes. But that's alright, we'll take the card advantage instead. Out of Oblivion is here, and right at home in any token-focused deck, allowing us to draw a card per turn and keeping our hand full. Return of the Wild Speaker is either drawing us a ton of cards or boosting our board state and allowing us to hit hard, but more often than not, we're looking to draw those cards. A lot of them at that point, since our fractals tend to get pretty large pretty quick. Growth Spiral is up next, not only drawing us a card, but also allowing us to ramp a little bit in the process. Granted, we need to have a land in hand after we draw a card, but with how often we're drawing these extra cards, it's not, you know, it's not really an issue. We don't run into issues here. It's all good. Commander's Insight follows up our Spiral and lets us draw X cards, plus one for each time we've cast our Commander. It's a little expensive paying four mana to draw two cards and could probably be swapped out for something a little stronger, but as it stands right now, it's in the deck. Brainstorm is a great card selection, especially if we have a way to shuffle our deck after the fact. We're breaking even in terms of card advantage since we spent a card to effectively gain two cards. But we get to pick and choose how we want to keep cards in our hand, allowing us to save some cards for later on. 
Blue Sun Zenith is basically repeatable commander's insight without the bonus for all the times we've cast our commander. Of course, if an opponent's deck is also looking a little low, we can always spend the extra mana and just force them to overdraw to take them out. Golden Ratio is up next, allowing us to draw a card for each different power among creatures we control. With the wide range of ever-increasing powers on our board, we're sure to draw a ton of cards off of this. We only have one creature offering us some card draw, but they play a vital role in this deck, and that's Curiosity Crafter. They offer us no maximum hand size, and make it so whenever our tokens punch an opponent in the face, boom, we get cards. The last piece of the card draw engine is in the form of Teferi, Master of Time. Though I'm definitely considering moving him to my Super Friends deck, uh, but it'll take a few turns to get him up to his alt for those extra turns, but in the meantime, we're going to draw cards, discard cards, every single turn, not just our own. Some of these cards have shown themselves to be a little expensive, so we need to go to Ramp City, where the mana dorks are overflowing and the lands are oh so searchable. Topping that list is Geyer Engineer, who taps for two mana, a green and a blue. He's a little squishy and a little valuable, but with a much bigger threat on the board, he tends to stick around. Incubation and Druid falls up our Engineer, and while they are initially only tapping for one mana, they'll eventually tap for three. Marleaf Pixie is up next, and this 2-2 flyer taps for both of our Simic colors, making them nice and flexible. Old Growth Tree is kind of slow ramp and token generation all rolled into one. When they die, they come back as an enchantment on a forest, allowing us to tap for extra mana. We're also then given the option to uh, pay one and tap and sack that forest to get back a 4-4 Trampley Boy. Quandrix Apprentice is here with Magecraft, allowing us to look at the top three cards of our library, grab a land, add it to hand. Quandrix Cultivator follows him up, cheating out some basic lands for us. This makes the Cultivator a prime target to copy, since the 3-4 body base sport is decent enough, but the land ramp is icing on the cake. A tune with Aether is another nice way to thin out the deck, and while it's not true ramp, it can help us avoid missing land drops. Cultivate, by comparison, is ramp proper, grabbing us two lands, one for our hand and one for the field. Emergent Sequence is last of the non-mana rocks to go over, turning a land from our deck into a fractal with power and toughness equal to the number of lands we've seen ETB this turn. I've mentioned a mana rock already, but we have a few more to go over in the form of Arcane and Simic Signet, as well as Soul Ring. Our other decks definitely lean more heavily into these mana rocks, but with the amount of ramp we have from other sources, it's just not necessary here. It's time to control the board with counter spells, removal, and protection. Normally I'd split these up into separate categories, but we're going to try something a little different this time. Let me know which way you prefer in the comments down below. We're countering a spell or ability with Void Slime. This 3 mana counter spell is nice and versatile, allowing us to stop the abilities of permanents our opponents manage to get onto the field, as well as any spells they attempt to cast. Tail's End is easier to cast, but targets a few less things. We're still hitting those abilities, but we're limited to only legendary spells. Quandrix Command can bounce creatures and planeswalkers, or counter artifact and enchantment spells. The extra counters on a creature and the ability to shuffle some cards from Grave into Library is cool, but a little less relevant here. Narset's Reversal lets us copy a spell and then put it back into the hand of the caster. This stifles their spell, forcing them to spend mana to cast it again. Memory Lapse is in a similar spot, but also puts them a turn behind, forcing them to redraw it. And if you have some mill, which we don't in here, but someone else might, you can get rid of the card altogether. Crosin's Grip is a nice way to remove a pesky artifact or enchantment, and the fact that it has split second is icing on that cake, making it really hard to counter. Heroic Intervention protects your board from most board wipes and prevents your creatures from being the target of any other spells or abilities this turn. This allows us here to be a better Void Slime. Same effect, easier casting cost since it doesn't require any green mana. Decisive Denial can force a fight you know you'll win or counter a non-creature spell if an opponent can't or doesn't want to pay 3 extra for it. Baral's Expertise is up next and lets us bounce three things to hand, then cast a spell for free as long as it costs four or less. We have one last card to go over, and it's the Golden Nightmare of the deck. Tanizer Quandrix. This powerful dragon is going to double up the plus one plus one counters on a creature when he ETBs. Then when he attacks, I can raise the base power and toughness of all my other creatures to match his. 
With a lot of my tokens being less than 4-4 base power and toughness, many of them actually being 0-0 base power, uh, this is a huge boost. Before we wrap things up, we do have some honorable mentions that would be great in the deck, but I just don't have extra copies. Those being Doubling Season and Parallel Lives. But guys, uh, with those out of the way, that's the deck. I hope, uh, I hope you'll like it, and that you're looking forward to seeing the Doctor Who deck tax, which should be starting up next Sunday at noon Eastern Time. Were there cards that I missed when making the deck? Cards that you questioned being in here? A commander that you'd like to see a build around? Let me know in the comments section down below, and if you want help with your own decks, or just to sling spells on spell table, consider joining the Discord. But until next time, good luck with your builds.